Good evening, everybody. Good Yom Tif. Welcome to uh, the International Yud Shvat Fabrengen. We're being joined now by thousands of uh, people from all over the world who are hooked on to this Fabrengen, both via the telephone as well as uh, through the websites in honor of Yud Shvat the 58th yard site of the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe and the day that the Rebbe assumed the leadership of Chabad Lubavitch. We're going to begin with a melody, with a nigan. This is uh, known as the melody of the Benini, which was actually a favorite song by the Baal Ha'ilula, by the previous Rebbe, who appreciated this song uh, particularly. So we're going to begin our Fabrengen this evening in honor of Yud Shvat with this nigan. We have here a few yeshiva students with us who will be joining us to help out singing, and you're all invited wherever you are in the world to say a l'chaim and to tune into the Fabrengen and to uh, connect with each other At this auspicious day. So we're going to begin with the Nigan of the Benini, and following the melody, we will uh, continue the Fabrengen, um, uh, sharing some ideas, some thoughts, some feelings, some stories, and then also um, singing again, and so on and so forth. <laughs>
L'chaim, l'chaim, l'chaim v'levracha. I want to begin with a story that is uh, extremely relevant to this day. But the story, to appreciate the story, I think requires a preface, an introduction. As I mentioned earlier, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe passed away in Tovshin Yud in 19, 1950. For the first year, his son-in-law, the Rebbe, refused quite adamantly to accept the leadership of Chabad and to assume the position of a Rebbe. Um, this wasn't just uh, playing hard to get, but rather uh, those who were here remember and recall, and I heard it from them, it was a very genuine refusal. The Rebbe absolutely refused to accept the leadership. And it was only a year later, at the first yard site, Yud Shvat 1951, that the Rebbe officially assumed leadership. And the symbol of that was that at the Fabrengen, at the gathering, at the Hasidic gathering that took place during the first anniversary of the previous Rebbe's yard site, on Yud Shvat 1951, the Rebbe said a mimer. A mimer Hasidus is a discourse of Hasidus uttered in a particular tune that was said by all the Rebbes of Chabad beginning from the Alter Rebbe. Till that point, the Rebbe always refused to say a Maimer. He would only say what we call Sichais, which means he would give different talks, not in the melody of a discourse, of a Hasidic discourse, and not the same style of a Maimer. At that Fabreng in Yud Shvat 51, he said a Maimer, and it began Basi Lagani Achaisi Kala, which we discussed at length earlier, the same discourse that his father-in-law gave out for his passing, he, qu he quoted that verse and began to explain it. And each year on Yud Shvat, since, he would say a mimer, a discourse, that would begin with these words, Basi Lagani Achai In the first one, in the first Basi Lagani, at some point in the discourse there, he shares a story about each of the Rabbeim, each of the Chabad Rabbeim, the six, the six Chabad Rebbes before him, from the Alter Rebbe, through the previous Rebbe, the Rebbe Rayatz, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak, he shares a story about each of them. And the way he got into sharing this story was in a particular context. He was discussing the fact that in life, a person cannot afford to detach himself from other people and to detach himself from the fate of the world. Rather, it's our responsibility to confront the darkness of the world and to transform it into light. And to confront the darkness within ourselves and to transform it into light. And to confront sometimes the darkness in other people and help them transform it into light. And he discussed at length there how the Avaida, the primary work of the Jew is to take the shtus of the Nefesh of Bahamas, to take the insanity of his beastly soul, to take the animalistic, egocentric um, uh, habits and instincts and addictions and cravings and disposition of the animal soul and challenge it and confront it and deal with it and educate it and refine it and ultimately try to transform it to what he called shtustik dusha, which means holy insanity. To take unholy insanity and to transform it to holy insanity. And discussing this, he said that the Rebbes, the leaders of the Jewish people, did not only preach, they didn't only pontificate. They lived what they spoke. So he said this principle is also true in their life. It's not only they spoke about it, they lived it. They did not live a life in which they said, you know, let me live in a cocoon, let me isolate myself in a very safe environment that's pervaded by serenity and holiness and tranquility and transcendence. And somehow I will communicate messages that will go out to other people. But rather they themselves had the courage and the humbleness and primarily the self-sacrifice of time, of character, of resources, of energy to detach themselves from their own spiritual state and to deal with, whole, with unholy insanity, to deal with darkness in the world, to deal with people in a very direct and personal and intimate way, and sometimes people who are in a very lowly level, and help them, inspire them, pick them up and embrace them. 
In other words, they didn't only preach the doctrine of Avas Yisrael. They didn't only lecture about the need for loving other people and other Jews. They lived it. And he then shared a story about each one of the Rebbe's to convey this idea. The story the Rebbe shared of the Alter Rebbe, the first Rebbe of Chabad was that once on Yom Kippur, when he was davening in Shul, he left Shul. In the middle of Yom Kippur, he took off his talus and he left Shul. And he went to the far end of the city, where there was a woman who gave birth to a baby, and there was nobody to help out. And she was starving for food. And she was a woman who just gave birth, so she needed it. And the Alter Rebbe himself prepared the wood and made a fire and cooked up a yoich, he cooked up a soup for this woman. If the Alter Rebbe would have asked somebody to do it, it would have been their greatest honor, their greatest pleasure. But he didn't ask anybody. He himself went to do it. Mitzvah begadah, as the Gemara says about Pikoach Nefesh, it's a mitzvah that the greatest of the people should do it. On Yim Kippur, the holiest time of the year, he didn't have to think for a moment. Should I detach myself from this great experience? There was a woman who needed help because she just gave birth to a baby. He left everything behind. He left the holiest day behind. He left the holiest environment behind. And he went to cook a soup for her. Quite not in the spirit of Yom Kippur. And he didn't send an agent. He didn't send an emissary. And then the Rebbe continued telling stories about the other Rebbe. He told a story about the Mittler Rebbe and about the Tzamech Tzedek, the Rebbe Maharash, the Rebbe Rashab. And uh, he said from his father-in-law, there are many stories. And um, for example, the story he told about uh, the Mittler Rebbe, after the, the Alter Rebbe, was the following story. A young man, a younger man, a young man came to the Mittler Rebbe, and he uh, asked the Mittler Rebbe for a way to repair, for a tikkun, to repair what's known as chatas uh, ne'urim, which means um, uh, immoral behavior relevant to a person's uh, intimate uh, elements. And uh, he asked the Mittler Rebbe for a tikkun to help him repair such types of behavior in which he uh, behaved immorally when it came to how Torah um, uh, wants the Jew to treat his procreative organs and this person behaved in an unethical way. And he came to the Mittler Rebbe for a tikkun for a way to do tshuva. And the Mittler Rebbe rolled up his sleeve and he showed that in one particular place the skin withered away. It was very dry. And the Mittler Rebbe said, this was caused from your chatas nurim. This was caused from your immoral behavior concerning your intimate life. What was he trying to say? He was trying to tell this person and bring out how deeply he was connected to him. The Mittler Rebbe, the son of the Alter Rebbe, anybody who reads his discourses knows, if I could express myself this way, he was a mystic par excellence. The Mittler Rebbe could say my marim of chassidus that went for hours and hours. He once said a mimer 17 hours long. He would say my marim 10 hours, 12 hours, 14 hours. He lived on a different plane completely. And yet, he was so makusha, he was so connected to each one of his disciples, that even somebody who fell very low, and behaved in a very, very wrong way in the privacy of his life, it affected the Mittler Rebbe in his physical self, because he was totally connected, and intertwined and interconnected with these people to the extent that their moral state affected him directly and intimately and personally. He never detached. And I guess it would make sense that the reason he told this to this person was because in a way it gave him tremendous hope. Because if, it works both ways in the negative and the positive. Because if when you fall very low, you schlep the Rebbe with you, that means there's also hope for you to get out. Because if the Rebbe is there with you, so then you can schlep yourself out of the hole. If you're on your own, so you may say there's a point of no return. There's a point where I fell down so low and I really, it's beyond coming back, it's beyond elevating myself. But knowing in the negative that if I schlep down the Rebbe with me into the abyss, so in a, one way it's a very negative idea because look who you're affecting. But that also means that there's hope to come out. Because if he's there with you, he's not staying there. He's going out. So there's hope for you also to go out. 
um, uh, which reminds me of a story. It's not the story I wanted to tell you initially, that I will get there soon. But, uh, but uh, this reminds me of another story. It's a cute story. The story goes like this. There was a... Uh, there was a chassid who once asked a question. It's known in Hasidic circles, and it's mentioned in a few Hasidic works too, that a tzaddik, a rebbe, a spiritual leader of a community of Hasidim, after he passes away, he doesn't go straight into paradise. He first goes through the Gehenim. He goes through purgatory. And from purgatory, he schleps out his Hasidim. His followers, his disciples, he schleps out. He takes them out of purgatory and he takes them with him to Gan Eden, to paradise. It's known, it's an old Hasidic tradition. So somebody asked the question, if he has the power to take people out of purgatory, so why doesn't he take everybody out of purgatory? Why doesn't he take all the Jews out of purgatory? Why does he take only his own? If he doesn't have the power to take people out of purgatory, okay, so he doesn't have. But if he does have the power, if he has the ability to take people out, vaharaya, his chasidim, he liberates them from, from that condition. So why doesn't he extend his grace and his love towards other Jews, even though they're not his chasidim?